afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, the BETD here was overshadowed by the cruel attack of Russia against Ukraine. 13 months later, this war and its consequences still dominate the political stage above all for the Ukraine, for the population in Ukraine. And it also dominates our support for Ukraine, which we assume will have to continue to be intense over the coming months, and we will be glad to provide it. In many areas, this situation goes beyond Ukraine itself, and it is uh, threatening the reserves of our society. Nevertheless, I would like to say that the situation as we see it today is different from the situation last year. Because today, we can say that we have managed winter. We've got through the winter and that we also managed to secure energy supply in Germany and in Europe without any, seeing any difficulties in energy supply. And it was possible over a short period of time to offset a large proportion of energy imports that we have lost. And that is a great achievement of our society here in Germany, our societies in Europe, uh, of industry and the economy here in Europe. And I think we can say that as an economy and as a society, we got through this crisis in a stable and solidarity-based way without any energy disruptions for either industry or consumers and also without any permanent fossil lock-in effects. However, and I would like to mention this as well, at this meeting it was neither urgent nor useful to interrupt the German phase out of uh, nuclear power. In two weeks' time, the last nuclear power plant in Germany will go off the grid. And as Minister for Nuclear Safety, I can say that this is great news and it makes our country a safer place. I don't think anyone here in the room would have thought a couple of years ago that nuclear power plants just a few hundred kilometers from us here could become a target in a war and could be attacked. For consumers, we were able to avert the most severe consequences of this energy situation. For example, thanks to the energy price guarantee, we were able to mostly, largely, not completely, avert uh, any energy prices that would have overwhelmed consumers. And that will also continue the focus of our work, and we will be happy to provide the support where it's needed. First and foremost, the German economy and the German society proved to be resilient against the crises of recent years. In these times, we saw how important solidarity is, our solidarity with Ukraine, but also solidarity within our societies. And we also saw how important it is to have a strong state in times like these, a state that is capable of taking action. We will tackle the major ecological crisis of our times with the same decisiveness. You here in this room are probably thinking about the climate crisis first and foremost, and of course the large transformation that we are facing now as societies, as economies, the phase out from fossil fuels and the decarbonization of our economy in general. A current study by the uh, Ministry for the Environment and the Ministry for Economic Affairs published last year uh, shows what the cost for our society would be if we 
interrupted this transformation process in view of the current geopolitical uh, situation. Researchers found that until the middle of this century, the cumulative macroeconomic impact would be 280 to 900 billion euros if we didn't tackle climate change. So these are huge sums, difficult to imagine, and these are forecasts that motivate us as a government to act urgently, and that is what we're doing. There are many energy experts, energy ministers here at this conference, and that's why I don't want to go into too much detail about the energy transition. There will be other occasions to speak about this at this conference, but I would like to point out that the climate crisis is not the only ecological crisis we're faced with. There is also the crisis of biodiversity loss that is threatening the basis of our economy and society because the functionality of e ecosystems is suffering from the loss of biodiversity. So the ecosystem functions that are essential for agriculture, that are essential to protect us from flooding, to protect our coastlines, and also the question of storing carbon in our ecosystems, be it in moors, in old forests, or in floodplains, intact floodplains, in soil that can store water, both to prevent drought and to uh, protect us in times of extreme weather events. This loss is what we're faced with if we don't manage uh, biodiversity loss. And we've seen the impact it can have in the economic disasters, not only in African and Asian countries, but also here in the heart of Europe. And this also showed us that action is urgently needed in this area if we want to protect our societies and our economies. At the moment, in Spain, we're seeing the first major wildfires this year, and we fear that uh, it won't stop at that. So when it comes to stabilizing our ecosystems and protecting biodiversity, these two issues are on the same level and require decisive action. This is necessary to combat the climate crisis by storing carbon in intact ecosystems. But on the other hand, stable and intact ecosystems also allow us to prevent crises and to protect us better from the impact of the climate crisis in a way that dry forests and wildfires can't do, nor sealed and concreted over soil can, because these areas cannot absorb water and cannot help us to adapt to the consequences of climate change. That is the second big point that I would like to make today. And the third major ecological crisis of our time is the pollution crisis. And that is probably best known to all of you uh, through the example of plastics pollution in the oceans. But the fact that we have advanced as far as we have with pollution to a point where ecosystems and the basis for our food chain from the ocean is already threatened by this pollution and is threatening us as humans, is threatening our health, this is a call for us to act as uh, governments, as societies, and to protect us against this pollution crisis that we have caused ourselves. This will also make an important contribution to combating the climate crisis, because without an economy that spares resources, that uses less material and less new raw materials than we do today, and without circular economy, without these steps, we will not be able to get on top of the climate crisis because raw material extraction and transport, the processing of raw materials and a lack of circular economy creates such a large proportion of greenhouse gases 
that we will not be able to overcome the climate crisis without building functioning circular economies. And that is much more than just recycling plastic waste. This means a serious circular economy. All these decisions and these transformation processes also make us more independent of imports. And it may sound a bit um, old in times like these, but these steps make sure that we have clean air, clean water, cities that are worth living in, and healthy landscapes that we as politicians owe to our citizens. I would like to use two examples to explain this. First of all, we need a nature-based energy transition. So the massively accelerated expansion of renewable energies, uh, wind power, onshore, offshore, photovoltaics, um, electrolyzers, we have to manage these projects in a way that is compatible with nature, that offsets the impact on nature so that we don't fuel another ecological crisis with this. And the energy transition itself also has to be uh, carried out in a way that spares resources because we have a huge demand of raw materials and we have to make uh, huge investments in a short periods of time. So we need to ensure sustainable funding and a raw material sensitive energy transition. In order to save raw materials, the Federal Ministry uh, for the Environment is currently working on the circular economy strategy, which places a great focus on the development of functioning and closed loop material cycles. So far, there was a strong focus on avoiding waste and reusing waste, but that is a point of view that we have to change so that at the beginning of the development cycle of products and technologies, we already consider how these products can be reused at the end of their product life and how they can be maintained in the raw material cycle. Another point I would like to mention is that in the case of certain raw material sources, uh, we don't want to use them in the foreseeable future. What I'm trying to say is that we don't need them on the one hand and that we should not use them on the other because tackling these raw material sources or these raw material locations would Im uh, imply such a strong interference with the ecosystem that we would not be able to foresee the consequences of interfering with such uh, ecosystems. Of course, I'm talking about deep sea mining where Germany is observing a precautionary pause. So Germany has declared that we will not be using deep sea mining until there is sound scientific insight and a strong body of rules for the use of raw materials from an area, from an ecosystem in this world that we know almost nothing of today. The last example I would like to give today is uh, nature-based climate action. The moderator already uh, mentioned a comprehensive approach. In Germany, we will be using nature-based climate solutions and these solutions will focus on recultivating and rehabilitating ecosystems. So, for example, we will be uh, reforesting uh, forests, we will be rehabilitating seagrass beds, and we will be re-naturating, uh, rehabilitating floodplains to obtain positive climate effects. This will uh, have a positive influence on climate protection because these ecosystems can store carbon at a large scale. And if we want to continue using natural resources or if we continue losing natural resources through wildfires and droughts, we have to invest, on the other hand, to maintain ecosystem services and ecosystem functions. And therefore, we want to use this action program of nature-based solutions, which will be approved by the federal government tomorrow, and an investment of 4 billion euros in Germany in the coming four years. We want to make sure that 
uh, rehabilitation can take place on a larger scale. And that is not only a contribution to climate protection, but also a contribution for maintaining biodiversity and that it is also a means of preventing the inevitable consequences of climate change that we can already foresee today. Ladies and gentlemen, on the international level, we made great progress in recent months. The climate conference in Sharm el-Sheikh did not achieve the progress that we had hoped for and that would have given rise to satisfaction. But in December in Montreal, we were able to agree on the global framework for biodiversity, which has a strong focus on nature-based solution. And when it comes to the framework for protecting biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions, we actually wrote international law history because this is the first legal framework that sets out legal provisions for protecting nature in the high seas. In Nairobi, in March last year, we agreed on, or rather we launched the International Plastics Treaty, which refers to circular economy as well. It is a positive experience for me that the international community was able to agree on relevant, difficult and controversially discussed points in an extremely difficult geopolitical situation. That was a really positive experience for all of us. It encourages us to tackle problems once we have acknowledged them and to set the path for the future, to set the course that will allow us to overcome the three big ecological crises of our times. Now it is time for me to wish this conference fruitful discussions and to thank you all for your attention. I'm looking forward to the inspiration that will come from this conference today and tomorrow. Thank you very much.